from Detroit to the nations, you are listening to the world's number one Christian station, Worship Center Radio, the platform of champions. God bless you. You've logged on to the Preached Word broadcast. Our program format consists of sound biblical teaching, the unadulterated word of God, teaching series, invited guests, and interviews. I'm Pastor Constance Harvey, your program host. Now let's go into today's program. God bless you. This is Pastor Harvey, and I'm so excited for all of those that have joined in and that you will continue to join in on this series that we're been, that we are teaching on the sexual sins of the Bible. We've been on this series since about the last of October, and I'm telling you, it is getting to be more eye-opening than ever before. And those of you that tuned in on last week and you had a chance to share and experience the experiences of uh, Brother Juan Johnson, and I think he's also on the line tonight that he'll be uh, chiming in from here to there to help us to continue to uncover uh, some of the sexual sins that are plaguing the people of God. Yes, the people of God. And I want to say that uh, if you haven't uh, been with us long in this series, that you can go onto worshipcenterradio.net, click on the Preach Word uh, 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 logo there, and you're able to um, log in and to... um, hear all of the archived, hit the archive button, and it'll bring you to the uh, past or the programs that have been aired in the past, bringing you up to speed as to where we are now. And so much has been said. I've listened to this broadcast from last week uh, on a couple of different occasions and just began to pick up more and more and more. Now, we want to continue uh, from where we were on last week, and I think we left off, as a matter of fact, I'm sure that we left off with uh, the clergy immorality. And before we change and go over to the next topic, to the very next topic, which is compromise, we're going to touch on if we can tonight, I want to give uh, some steps for recovery in clergy immorality. Uh, just to recap, we said that uh, some of the common judgments of sexual immorality uh, for the clergy is lost ministry of em- or employment. That is their job, employment. So that ministry is lost, and this act can result in excommunication from clergy privileges and being fired from your job. Look at First Samuel, the second chapter. You can lose out uh, with the ministry that you have been established to be shepherd over. It also incurs broken fellowship with God. Your walk with God is going to be impeded. And then there's loss of integrity. A good name is better to be had than silver and gold. To you, you need to protect your reputation with everything that is in you. And even when some people have been placed on a sexual offenders list, on a sexual offenders list, uh, lost destruction of family, your family uh, becomes non-functional, Second uh, Samuel, the 12th chapter, uh, uh, some of the judgment can result in a lawsuit that you've been found guilty of clergy council uh, uh, um, relationships that have been broken and um, therapeutic deception. Also, jail time. Many states have passed laws against clergy uh, immorality, and ministers are going to jail in an alarming rate. Now, let's see how we can recover from this. You know, I, 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 I don't mind hearing war stories. You know, it's sometimes war stories are, uh, uh, can give you an uh, opening and can show you where you are. But at the end of the war story, like with Brother Juan on last week, how did you get out of this? And I know that of all of the million people that are listening to this particular 
uh, streaming broadcast at this particular time on whatever media you're using, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, uh, YouTube, whatever media that you're using, that we have someone that has fallen into this immorality, and you want to know how to come out of it. You want to know exactly how to come out of it. Now, it takes a mindset. First of all, it takes a mindset. Your mindset is in twofold. It's in twofold. You need to judge the sin, first of all. First Corinthians 5, 7 through 9, and verse 13, judge the sin. Judge the sin. Make sure that you are not in love with the sin to the point that you just let it go. The Greek word here means uh, uh, krino, which means to sentence or punish. And this punishment is a constructive plan of restoration, not condemnation, restoration. you got to remember that God intends to restore our lives. He God intends to restore our lives. In other words, to put us back together again, put us back together again. And Galatians 6 and 1, restore such a one with the spirit of meekness, considering your own selves. In other words, to thoroughly repair or to mend that person, like sort of similar like a, a broken bone. You know, sometimes when a bone is broken, the, uh, the doctor wants to set it. And they set it in such a way and cast it in that when it heals, it's as if it's never been broken again. So there are some steps that you need to follow if you're going to be restored, some steps that need to be followed uh, uh, in correcting any sexual sin in any congregational setting. And uh, just like with adultery, we said you must confront there should be confrontation. Sexual sin is a deep-seated problem, and it cannot be avoided, but it must be swiftly approached. You have to deal with it. I want you to read or make a note to yourself to read in Second Samuel, the 12th chapter. And then there should be repentance. And, and godly sorrow worketh repentance that needed not be repented of. The sorrow of the world, you know, worketh death. In other words, you're just not sorry because you got caught. You're not sorry just because you got caught, but you are truly repentant, a uh, turning away or a separation from that sin. And then uh, 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 God can begin to deliver you. Psalms 51 and 2 Samuel, the 12th chapter. Demand that any and all involvement is broken off immediately. I don't know where this concept that you can wean off of sin. You don't wean off of sin. You break it off immediately. Immediately, and then there is a, a a setting down, a setting down. A fallen minister loses the rights to ministerial privileges until sufficient restoration has occurred. Okay, the ministry of a minister is based on character and integrity. First Timothy three. We're looking at the qualifications. We're studying that in our Bible class. That that Paul left on record for Timothy. There are seventeen qualifications for a preacher. Uh, 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 13 qualifications for the deacon and even for the deacon wives. And integrity, character and integrity is one of them. You know, this is what uh, people uh, 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 base character and integrity on, and this is what people follow and admire is the God in you, okay, not the you in you. And once you've lost that, you lose people. People are following you because of the God in you. Not the you in you. And when you lose the God that's in you, because sin will break that fellowship with God, okay, then you lose people. Then you, lo then you lose people. So the, so the mindset has to be twofold. I need to judge sin, and then I need to find uh, restoration. And those are the steps that we said uh, that you can find. Also, if you find yourself uh, uh, falling in this group, accountability. If you're going to stay safe, accountability. Accountability. You should have some type of restoration committee. Accountability. Someone that you can be accountable to. As we were saying on last week, Brother Juan brought out so beautifully that women should have women that they are accountable to. Men should have men and uh, 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 overseers that they are accountable to. Also, counsel. The fallen minister should be counseled by experienced leadership, Proverbs 11 and 14. Experienced leadership. Not a novice, 
That was one of the instructions that Paul gave to Timothy, lay hands suddenly on no one, no man, not a novice, not a novice. All right. The fallen minister should be counseled by experienced leadership and restitution. When you've fallen from a ministerial duty, you're in debt to the people that uh, uh, you have injured. And sin is never private. It's never private. So you're in debt to the people that you have injured. There have been so many people that have uh, lost their walk with God looking at man not realizing that he is human as well, even though he is the leader, looking at man, and when that man took a tumble, took a fall, they themselves were so injured and so wounded so they couldn't hardly uh, overcome that. Many people did not overcome that. Your decisions that you make infects uh, uh, your entire world. People treat you the way they see you. If they hear something bad about you, it'll change the way they see you and treat you. And this is particularly true for a Christian. A Christian is a connected part of the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27. And what you do affects other Christians. So restitution means paying back the things uh, 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 taken. And sexual sin causes a lot to be lost. When you fall into a sexual sin, it causes a lot to be lost. A fallen minister must put back the trust, the respect, the unity, the peace, and everything that was destroyed. That was destroyed. And then this helps the injured heart to heal. Time. Time is also very important. Some folks want to get up and say, well, okay, I'm sorry, I made a mistake and I failed. Then you want to be uh, uh, having a pastoral celebration on the next month. It doesn't work like that. It's important that a fallen minister does not return to the ministry before restoration has been totally completed or what? Those sins, that those seeds that are still there will germinate and ferminate and live again and live again. It takes time. Yes, God forgives, but, honey, it's going to take some time for you to work through a lot of things and begin to feel the anointing and the power of God again. Okay, it will be devastating for both the minister and the congregation if a minister returns too soon, hasn't been totally uh, destroyed. You know, uh, a, a tree is known by its fruit is what Jesus said in Matthew, the seventh chapter and the 20th verse. Fruit, fruit don't come up overnight. How you figure you didn't fail from grace and now you got fruit the next day? It doesn't work like that. It needs time. True fruit is only revealed over a period of consistent godly behavior. And I'm not saying that that, that uh, uh, you will never be restored, but it takes time. It takes time. And moving, this is another thing, moving from one city to the next city before total restoration has occurred is not the solution. It's not the solution. Are you listening, Brother Juan? Yes, ma'am. All right. It's important to note that a minister's restoration, uh, 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 it, like I just said, it should recur uh, within his local church. You know, the church should help uh, 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 and aid in the recovery process. Some people may disagree and prefer to send the minister away to a special center or program, but I don't agree. That. I don't agree that if he failed there, he needs to be restored there, and it takes time to do that, and people need to see the restoration process. He needs to bear fruit once again with his local assembly. Don't send him uh, to Africa somewhere. One, 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 one pastor fell from adultery, church closed down, and they're going to end the, the uh, denomination, send him over to Africa somewhere. He's taking the same spirit with him to Africa. He's going to do the very same thing when he gets there, when he gets there. Okay, and also a part of the restoration process, I know a lot of people don't want to hear this, but the church has to be responsible to forgive. Church has to be responsible to forgive. After you have been shuttered by a leader that you trusted, that you admired, that you looked up to, you are going to have to forgive, even though you're going to feel anger, you're going to feel like you've been tricked, that you've been lied to, that you're confused, that you, uh, you're you going to point blame, unforgiveness, and insecurity, but you're going to have to forgive. God taught us that uh, a powerful lesson on forgiveness, and that forgiveness means to pardon or to release the person, to pardon or to release them. 
And forgiveness is the will of God. He's willing that we can forgive. Forgiveness is not a suggestion or a human opinion. It's not just a suggestion. Well, I just suggest that you uh, uh, look at him in a different light, look at her in a different light. It's not a suggestion, but it is the will of God, and it's not conditional. It's not conditional. God says forgive, period. And this means if a person never apologizes or makes things right, you are still obligated to forgive and to release them. Why? Because it's the mark of God, uh, uh, the will of God in Mark eleven twenty five. God forgave us. He forgave us of all of our sins, of all of our trespasses, of every time we missed the mark, every time we was perverse in dealing with him, God forgave us. In the cross of death of Jesus Christ, God provided the grounds for forgiveness for your sins for your sins, for my sins, for the sins of the whole world. And if God can forgive us, we can forgive. And a lot of times we forget about the things that we have done in the dark, where the Bible says there were some things done in the dark that were even a shame, you know, for us to even mention again. I know there are some things that I've done that nobody knows but me, God, and the devil. Praise God. But God says forgive, forgive. So if he forgave us, We can forgive because God gave forgiveness to us. He has a right to ask us to forgive in Ephesians 4 and 32. And also uncover sin. Exposure of sin must be done uh, discreetly now. You know, in a setting where congregations are aware through rumors that something has happened to one of the leaders, the people deserve a tactful, a tactful explanation. Uncover the sin. Whosoever cover the sin shall not prosper, but whosoever confess them and forsake them shall have mercy. So, and then we need to express grief. Grief. People uh, must be given an opportunity to express their frustration, their anger, and their questions. And uh, I think that the leader should be called to a church meeting, according to Ecclesiastics 3 and 4, that a leader should be called to a church meeting. Let people get an opportunity to say, you know, uh, 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 pastor uh, girl, uh, pastor boy, we really had confidence in you, you know, what uh, what happened, what happened. And a lot of times you're going to find out that people fall when there is no accountability, when they are not accountable to anything or anyone, like multiple leadership accountability. You know, uh, 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 people kind of um, get the big head or, or, or I'm a law unto myself when they don't uh, uh, follow accountability. You need to be accountable. Make yourself accountable to experience, to older leadership. Be accountable to someone. Praise God. Uh, 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 Counseling. That fallen member should be brought into counseling. And then new leadership. This means a restored leader or a replaced leader. The congregation must see a change in leadership before healing to the congregation will occur. They need to see that the new, that the fallen leader has been totally restored or either a replacement leader. A replacement leader. Now, these steps that we've just outlined here will greatly aid the victims of clergy immorality in receiving the forgiving power and restoration, you know, of the Lord. Now, if you, we're here, we're here, you have an opportunity to call in and to ask any question. You can call us at 248-796-8241. Again, 248-796-8241. 248-796-8241. Get somebody on the telephone. Let's talk about some of these things talk about them because they're out here and they're real and as people of God we're in a day and a time now that we need to cry loud and spare not lift up our voices like trumpets show the people of God their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins it's time now we're in the last hours of the last days and we need to be accountable for carrying the gospel of Jesus Christ out and rightly dividing the word of truth Okay, the next sexual sin that we want to go into, if there are no questions in this area right now, and I'm here, you can call 248-796-8241, is compromise. Is compromise. Now, compromise is the act of putting oneself at danger or risk. At danger or risk. Matthew, the fourth chapter says, you should not tempt the Lord your God. In other words, uh, 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 
don't try the patience of God or don't try to take advantage of God's goodness by needlessly placing oneself in danger. In other words, you put yourself in a dangerous situation and then expect for God to cover you. You know, you expect for him to cover you. And that's called tempting God or compromising. Compromise, the devil came unto Jesus, say, cast yourself down from this mountain. Say, haven't he said he would give his angels charge over thee and that thou shalt not hurt that stuff? He said, why should I do that? I shouldn't do that. I'm not going to tempt the Lord thy God. I'm not going to tempt him. And a lot of times we get, I put ourselves in situations where you know you're in a dangerous or reckless situation. You're too close to the fire. You're too close to see it. You're too close. And you're thinking, well, the Lord will stop you in time. No, he's not. No, he's not. No, he's not. He'll stop you. He's not going to stop you in time. One lady was a, 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 a wonderful young lady in her church, was bringing people into the church. They had her in certain leadership and a couple of leadership positions, and she was just uh, 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 going forward, you know, directing the choir and just all types of things that were going on. And she was out with this guy, and they said, well, we're just going to go into the hotel and talk. So all we're going to do is talk. We're just going to talk. You know, come on. Nine months later, she had a beautiful bouncing baby boy. Pretty boy. Amen. Praise God. Uh, that's what we call compromising and tempting the Lord. You don't put yourself in an at-risk, a dangerous situation, and you're expecting for God to keep you and to stop you in time in that situation. Well, it, 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 didn't, it didn't happen like that. It didn't happen like that. So many people have gotten themselves in sexual traps because of compromise. Because of compromise. Now, one of the most common uh, traps is that our church leaders who minister to people of the opposite sex without ground rules. Without ground rules. And the Bible has already told us that Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. Elijah was a prophet. He was a spiritual leader. And he had like passions or the same nature as every other human being. He got, you have to guard and protect yourself. You cannot compromise. Oftentimes, people, including the leaders themselves, do not understand that leaders are human. I guess the leader feels like he's a superman or, or she's a superwoman and that uh, we have power over these things, but you have limitations as well. We eat, we sleep, we hurt, we bleed like anyone else. We can't walk around with the superman complex that it can't happen to me, that it'll, it never happened to me. How many of you remember Samson? Many remember Samson over in the book of Judges, the 16th chapter. I will get up as times before and shake myself. But when he shake, not knowing that his power was gone, that covenant relationship that he had with God was gone. That covenant relationship that he had with God was gone from the compromise that he made laying his head in the lap of Delilah. All right? All right, so his great strength and his might, you know, was asleep on Delilah's lap. And and she was a Philistine and a seductress. The Philistines were ungodly people. Here he was uh, uh, unequally yoked to start off with. He placed his whole entire life in jeopardy. Yeah, the whole entire life. And the result of this compromising decision was the loss of his life and his ministry. We don't want to risk all that we have invested the majority of the people they invest uh, are coming up uh, from the very beginning. Seeds, praise God, before they grow into an oak tree, small acorns, and then you get big and you risk the things that you have invested to get to where you are just for a very few minutes of pleasure. God has given us much and too much too many years of hard work, uh, work and, and to risk it over a few moments of sexual pleasure. Okay? Uh, another sexual, another common trap, another common trap is a married spouse who is unhappy at home but enjoys talking over lunch about uh, sexual, about marital problems with the co worker of the opposite sex. Uh, all right, Proverbs 7, 6 through 27. We can't read all of that. You write that down, Proverbs 7, 6 through 27. And the scripture teaches that there was a man who was drawn into sexual temptation because he was both curious and lacking in understanding, verse 7. Proverbs 7 and 7. He was curious. How many relational downfall people would put uh, 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 themselves in uh, risk just because they are curious? I wonder what it would be like if I had married so-and-so. I wonder what it would be like to be married to her. You know, it's some things that you really don't need to know. 
You don't need to know some places, some people, or 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 the opportunities that can give you, you know, uh, 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 things that you think that you have missed. They used to say um, when I was a little girl, I used to say it my own self, curiosity killed the cat. Amen. Satisfaction brought him back. No, he's not coming back. The cat does not have nine lives. Curiosity will kill the tech cat. What you don't know could save you. Do you say what you don't know won't hurt, but what you don't know could save you. Spouses who compromise their marriage are usually searching for something that is not at home and show a lack of good judgment or understanding. And whatever situation you find yourself, give no place or no opportunity to the devil. Uh, I preached a message one time, said don't. Let the devil ride. Pastor, if you I let him ride, in, he'll want to drive. Praise God. Can Hallelujah. I, I preach the message. Don't let the devil ride. So you have to be certain that you don't compromise, that you don't compromise out of curiosity, out of putting yourself in risky situations and in risky places that will wind up in sexual immorality, and that is one of the sexual sins of the Bible, compromising. Pastor, can I step in for a second? Yeah, go ahead. Right on, Brother Juan. I'm listening. Mm -hmm. Now, you said something about um, them not having the, uh, they're missing something at home and they're trying to find it somewhere else. A lot of times, that's not necessarily the truth. They have everything that they need at home. It's the fact that somebody else is offering it to them. That makes it, um, how do you say it? Um, um, it? It presents itself in a nice package to them. That could that 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 could very well be so, but the majority of the time is they're unhappy because they're not they, they're looking for somebody else to make them happy, you know, or or in in that um, in that area. Or they're not enjoying what's already there for them. They're overlooking that that is there that is already at home. I, I so agree most with of the that. Time that what draws you to that individual is still there with that individual. You know, most of the time when people get married, there are a lot of positive things, more positive things than negative things that have drawn them to each other. And that is still there. Sometimes when I do marital counseling, when counseling him, I said, what did you like about him before? I want you to give him a, both of them a sheet of paper and a, and a pencil. And I said, what is it that you liked about her that made you want to marry her? What is it that you liked about him that you wanted to marry him, you consented to marrying him? And sometimes they get the right and they get the right and they get the right and they have a long list and they begin to look at each other and say, oh, yeah, she did have that. Oh, yeah, he did have that. Oh, yeah, I do like, oh, she still has that. You know, and it kind of be the, uh, the uh, things that you, but they forget, as you were saying on last we they forget what it is that they have a lot of them forget what they do they have and then now it goes back to that imagination remember we talked about the imagination and they begin to imagine this is where the compromise come in you know like uh, uh, uh what would it be like uh with something new you know opportunities uh uh that can uh, maybe give you some sexual fun what would it be like you know to to go with a blonde instead of a brunette, you know what I'm saying. And so yeah, I think I thought you're you're right in that in that sense, and I and I know that you are in that sense. But I believe that a lot of this compromising coming from curiosity, a lot of it. You agree or what? I agree with that. I agree with. I do. I agree. I agree. One hundred percent. A lot of that compromising comes with curiosity. Just think about the lady sitting there that we talked about. You, you, you introduced me to this one last week, where we were saying how that, uh, how that the woman is sitting up there looking at the at the at the at the pastor, and the wife is sitting there and usually sitting right there next to him. A lot of times they they uh, 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 you know dress the pulpit there with with their husbands. And the woman is sitting out there looking at all the time instead of listening to the Word of God and being uh, uh, proactive with that. She's a, in her mind, she's talking about wondering what would it be like to be with him? What would it be like to be the first lady? I wonder how would it be if I, you know, was, was undressing for him each night. And, 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 and that curiosity begins to really take place. And you know what? It we will. begin to act. We begin to act on the thoughts. That's right. We, when those thoughts begin to come, we begin to act on them. The, we begin to act on them. If you don't cast down every imagination and every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, you're going to act on it. Every sin starts with the thought. 
And the Bible says Every, that. The Bible says that you could, if you commit adultery in your mind first. Right. You just to look on a man, just to look on a woman. If you even just look on them and desire them, you've already committed adultery with her or him. That's right. That's scripture. That's scripture. So in order to uh, to those that are struggling with compromise, those that are out there that are struggling with compromise, this is an issue with risk. It's an issue of risk. And some are willing to lower their standards to risk uh, valuable things. You know, to overcome compromise, you know, a lot of times we do say pray. We say pray, we say pray, and we say ask God, you know, to help you to, uh, uh, to overcome this. But there are some things. Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. There are some things that you're going to have to do if you're having an issue with compromising your stand. And that's to turn away from sin and ask God to forgive you. Ask God to forgive you. Turn away from your sin. Ask God to forgive you. In other words, repent. Acts 3.19. Now, avoid gambling uh, in every form of the word. Don't. <laughs> that, yeah, <laughs> that's gambling. Right. Proverbs, <laughs> Proverbs 16 and 33. Don't risk anything. Don't take a chance on anything. I put no confidence in the flesh. You know what, Pastor? What's funny about that? Because you, when you're saying this, the, the, you're telling the men, okay, men, stay out of that pretty girl's face at work. And, and there, you, there you are. There, and, exactly. And you, women, you're gambling. You're taking a risk. <laughs> I like that, Brother Juan. And you're women, taking a you risk can't. right now. You're risking all of that you built up That's at right. home, your your mortgages, your cars, That's your right. children, your integrity. Your future. Just looking at that pretty girl at work. Run. Joseph said, you can have my beautiful coat of many colors, but you're not going to take my integrity. And, and women, you can't have a husband at home and then a work husband, too. That's... That's something that needs to stop. Yeah, and and a lot of times uh, the 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 work, a lot of times the work uh, 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 atmosphere creates this. A work atmosphere creates this. I've known a lot of ladies to go into the automotive settings, and just about all of them in the automotive settings wind up having some type of uh, uh, guy that they're dating, even though they have somebody at home. Uh huh. Uh, Proverbs uh, sixteen and thirty three out of the New Living Tr uh, Translation say, "You may throw the dice, but the Lord determines how they fall." So you can't just take a chance and gamble everything away that you uh, you know that you have and that you've earned and that you've worked for. It's so heartbreaking uh, to see people that have been married thirty seven and thirty eight years and forty years and so and get divorced. Because someone in the uh, covenant relationship has been unfaithful. And on the same token, it's just a joy. I have a couple now that I'm just rejoicing with that have been married over 60 years. Over 60 years they've been married. Now that's a blessing. That's a blessing. Uh, and we also have to avoid sexual fantasies. And that's something that you talked on uh, on last week that we need to cast down every imagination and every thought that exalts itself into uh, 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 the knowledge of God and bring every thought into the complete captivity and make it obedient to what the Word of God is saying. You have to cast down those sexual fantasies. You cast them down. And another thing, let me say this here. Uh, someone may not agree with me, and, and that's okay. That's okay if you don't agree with me. You can call me. Call me at uh, 248-796-8241. 248-796-8241. You can call and if you don't agree with me. But I, light, a marriage license does not give you the sanctity to do all types of sexual fantasies, even within on the marital bed and within the confines of marriage. Oh, now, you may not again. agree with me. You might say, say what's going on in my uh, 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 private bedroom with my wife is my business and none of your business, Pastor Harvey. But I'm telling you, if you begin to open up that can of worms to your sexual fantasies, even though it's with your wife, you're going to have some problems down the road. Pastor, you, yes. you, you know, a lot, a lot of times that's because they um, try to do fantasies that have been perverted and not, not um, I, I shouldn't call them fantasies, with, you know, that are clean because most fantasies sometimes, that's why they call fantasies, they're way out there. But... 
certain things that you do with your wife that you've seen on movies or other things that you've seen on, sometimes it's not what your wife want to do. And you're basically introducing perversion to her. Yes. Yes. Yes, I agree. I agree. I agree 100%. And the and wives do say, the well, same thing okay. to the husbands. Whatever we do is fine because we're married. No, it's not. Keep the sexual fantasies because marriage is honorable and the bed undefiled. And you shouldn't want to do anything that's going to make anyone feel defiled. And, and women, and this goes for men too. So let me say everybody. Don't, everybody. Don't bring what you used to do with somebody else into your marriage. Right. Well, they should have been cleansed from that. And it goes right back to what we said on last week. If we do it God's way, then we would both come in with no uh, fantasies, with no no anything, nothing in the mind, nothing in the manage, because we have never been exposed to anything. Now, that mm-hmm. was the reason why God said for us to be virgins and to be chaste men and women. So there wouldn't for- be, so there wouldn't be any um, ideals of perversion when you're with That's the woman right. that you're supposed to be with. But you, we know in this day and age that mm-hmm. a lot of times that is not so. So we need to not bring in what um, your the person that you feel was your best in your life, even though you feel like my wife is not my best, but, you know, she was she was the one that was there, the, the one that I, I consider my best. I'm going to try to do the things with my wife or my husband that, you know, so I can get out of that, you know, situation, you know, my, my intimate moment with my wife or my husband, the same thing I used to get out of the moment with the one that I feel like that was my best. Well, wait a minute. Now right, you, now right, you're, right. Not, you're not even supposed to even have that in the beginning, but mm-hmm. since you have had that experience, let that die. We should be new creatures in Christ Jesus now. Let that die and move on to a wholesome, healthy relationship with that uh, with that wife that you have uh, now. In Second Corinthians, the tenth chapter, in the fifth verse, let me just read this. Uh, so that someone will know, and let me get that scripture out here to you. It says, we destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. And after you have become fully obedient, we will punish everyone who remains disobedient. So in other words, casting down every imagination and every thought that exalts itself against what you know about God and bring it into complete captivity complete captivity. One more thing here, one of the keys uh, uh, for overcoming compromise is to develop a sensitive heart of godliness. I really appreciate this book that Pastor Lewis Smith, and I want to give a shout out to him and uh, and uh, accolades to him. He really let the Lord use him uh, in putting together this text, uh, Sexual Sins of the Bible. Uh, Pastor Lewis Smith um, with a uh, with a um, forward by Dr. Miles Monroe, whom we know has gone on home to be with the Lord now. But we need to develop a sensitive heart for godliness. I want to be godly. Develop a sensitive heart for godliness. For the closer to God a person becomes, the harder it is to risk the goodness of God. Oh, that really blowed me away when I read that. The closer you get to God, the more you know about the goodness of God. I mean, the, the, you don't want to let that go. You know, the tighter that relationship is between you and God, the harder it is to risk the goodness of God. I, I, I know too much about him. Praise God. You can't make me doubt him. You remember that song, Brother Juan? You can't make me doubt him, for I know too much about him. And that's the way it is. The harder, uh, 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 the closer you get to God, the harder it is to risk the goodness of God. I'm not about to give up what God has done for me for a few moments of sexual pleasure. All right, you may not agree with me, and you may agree with me, but the lines are open. You can call us on the air at 248-796-8241. Again, that's 
888-528-8241. We have another subject here that's part of the list of sexual sins that we are going to be covering uh, uh, here. We, we're, we're moving along pretty good. We've done addictions. We've done um, uh, abortion. We've done adultery. Uh, we've done uh, quite a few of the uh, sexual sins that we have been talking about, uh, the clergy immorality, the compromise. And I want to go to uh, what's called cross-dressing. What's called cross dressing. That is a sexual sin and it needs to be dealt with. It needs to be it needs to be dealt with. It is so prevalent uh today and so alive, especially in some of these clubs that they call like um I think they call them gentlemen clubs. They have a lot of them uh, here, especially in Detroit, the Hot Tamale and Erotic City and and, and, uh, uh, Flight Club and a lot of those different clubs like that. They have a lot of the cross-dressing. I used to think that it was only uh, women. I used to think that it was only women that uh, would do the pole dancing and 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 uh, you know the kind of exotic dancing. And we're going to we have a a piece on that as well, the exotic dancing. Uh, you know that that can tantalize a person. That exotic dancing so much to the so to uh, Herod say, I give you uh, 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 up to half of my kingdom. Just tell me whatever you want. She had to dance so and pleased him so to he was willing to give away half of his kingdom uh, to Herodias' uh, daughter for the dance that she did. So we're going to talk about that as well. But on tonight, with the few minutes that we have left, we want to begin the study on cross-dressing. Cross-dressing. Now, Brother Wanda, you know what that cross-dressing really is? Yeah, it's a a form of um, homosexuality that just hasn't crossed all the way over. You you are 100% right because some of the... uh, uh, things that I'm going to present here, if they line up, they run parallel with mm-hmm. homosexuality. It sure does. With homosexuality. But now the cross dressing is the act of a person dressing in the clothes of the opposite sex to create sexual arousal. There's a reason why they cross dress. Now, in the book of Deuteronomy, the 22nd chapter in the 5th verse, we know it says that a woman should not wear anything that pertaineth to a man, nor a man shall put on a woman's garments. And this scripture was given by God for the very reason is to help protect sexual balance. You know, God intended that each sex is to maintain their original identity. You know, I, 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 when people look at you, the image that they get of you and uh, 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 is presented by the clothes that you wear, and those images send a message. So if you are a man, then you shouldn't send a confused message of being a lady with lady garments on. So clothes present an image, and images send messages. Images send messages. So in Genesis 38 and 14, we remember the scripture of how that uh, one day Judah saw his daughter-in-law, Tamara, and she was in a public place. And you know the story of what happened there is that he didn't recognize her. And the reason why he didn't recognize her is because she was dressed. Uh, in the very same way that a harlot or the temple prostitutes would be dressing, uh, 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 she, her husband had just died, so he definitely wasn't expecting for her to be out there. And um, she wasn't dressed in the way that widows dressed at that particular time. And so she uh, uh, went unnoticed, by, and, and she changed her face. Uh, she covered her face with one of those little light pieces of cloth, you know, in the manner that the temple prostitutes dressed. And so when her father-in-law, Judah, saw her, he unknowingly approached her to buy sex, thinking that he had advanced, you know, a prostitute, unaware that this was his own daughter-in-law. And what happened? What happened? Why was it that her, her that Judah approached her initially in the very beginning anyway? Why did he approach her? It was because of the way that she was dressed. Her clothes presented an image and sent a message. Okay? So her clothes presented an image and sent a message. Now, images and messages in themselves are not wrong. They're the nun, when we see her with a habit on, her clothes present an image and it sends a message. It sends a message. And when you go out and you see someone on the corner uh, scantily dressed and, 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 and you provocativeness about them, those clothes present an image, and they send a message. They send a message. You're, you're not going to have a John 
stopping a nun on the uh, on her way to 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 uh, uh, a mass to buy sex. Because why? Her clothes is going to stop her. Her clothes will stop him. So when you put on your clothes, you have to stop and ask yourself, what am I saying to the world? What am I saying to the world? Okay. Uh, the first two things, two things, two main things to consider. Does my choice of dressing bring confusion? You know, does my choice of dressing brings confusion? And we know First Corinthians say God is not the author of confusion. When a man dresses like a woman, a transvestite, that is so confusing. Okay, is a man inside of clothes that were designed to present the body and face of a woman, and this this reveals confusion and 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 confuses folks. When I was in when I was in um, when I was in college, and we were talking about different cultures, we were studying different cultures, and they had these two guys came in, and I mean it was just it was just mind blowing. These guys, these were big old men. They were guys. And they uh, were dressed immaculate. I mean, suits the woman would die for with the spectator shoes, hair immaculate, gloves. I mean, they they had they were just from head to toe. They were immaculate, and they were men. They were men. And one of the the men that was dressed like that was engaged to one of the women that was in the uh, uh, in the class. That's how they were able to get the door open to come in. Because they were cross dressers and and I'm saying, oh my God! And you're talking about confusion, and to the point that some of the men could not take it. They got up and just walked out in the middle of the presentation. They just got walk and walked out in the middle of the presentation. So a lot of this confusion starts in childhood. How do you think so? Give us a call at two four eight seven nine six eight two four one. You think you know. A lot of the confusion in the cross-dressing starts at childhood. Maybe a little boy spent too much time playing with female toys, like dolls, for example, or, or perhaps a child is involved in role-playing, where the little boy dresses in uh, dresses, panties, stockings, high heels, to play the role of a housewife, or a little girl who borrows a little brother's suit to dress like a man to play the role of a husband. It could very male start from there. And imagine these children having no adult supervision, playing this type of commonly played games every day as an after-school pastime. It's likely that the seeds of compassion will get planted in their understanding of sexuality. And the Bible tells us that whatsoever a man soweth the same thing he shall reap. A lot of our adult behavior started in our childhood. And when I was thinking about this and going over this, I remember how that when I was coming up, I don't know about uh, 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 many of you, but when babies were being born, then the woman knew that she was going to have a baby. Uh, 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 they would usually wouldn't wait until they didn't have ultrasounds and, and all this to tell you like months and months ahead of time uh, what the baby's sex was going to be. But they would wait. But once they found out, you know, the baby was born, the man would rush home. He would paint a room pink for girls and blue for boys. Everything was pink for pink for uh, 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 girls and blue for boys. They bought uh, uh, male toys and female gender toys. We never got a gun. I never got a gun for a Christmas present. I always got a doll. I always got a doll. So I only got one toy, but it's always going to be a doll. And the girls were dressed in pink. Even when you went to the hospital, they wrapped the girls up in pink blankets, and they wrapped the boys up in blue blankets. Now guess what they're doing? What do you think, Juan? What do you think they're doing? They have yellow. Yellow is for any gender. They have a mint green or light green. That's for any gender. You know, so that even from the from the womb, they're sending confusing messages. Uh, messages, mm -hmm. uh, and, and they're confusing the kids even from the womb, even from the womb. Even so. Secondly, when I put my clothes on, what type of message am I presenting to the world? When we're supposed to let our light so shine that men might see our good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven, what kind of uh, message am I sending to the world? When a man dresses like a woman or a woman dresses like a man, that is not a good image being presented. People should be able to look at your works, including the way we dress, and see God, you know. 
Apostle Paul summed it all up like this, put on, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are some people that, as Brother Juan said, have not went all the way over to sexuality, homosexuality. And that was one of the things that those guys that I was telling you about that did the presentation in my college class. They said, we're not homosexuals. The, man, the one man said, I'm engaged to such and such right there. You know, and, and, uh, but they're so close to it. As Brother Wine said, they're so close to it till they're just a, a, a blink of the eye away from it. And I really, 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 really can't see a man wanting to be dressed up with high heel shoes and girdles and stockings and bras. You'd be and, surprised. And, 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 and you not attract another man. What's the purpose of putting all that on mm -hmm. if you're not trying to attract the opposite sex? Women dress up with women clothes uh, to attract the, uh, the opposite sex to look good for their husbands, to look good for their for their dates and what have you. I mean, why would a man put on all of this stuff? Do you know how hard it is to wear a girdle? Why would you put all this stuff on if you're not trying to attract the opposite sex? And if you're trying to attract the opposite sex, there's something homosexual there. Hey, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong, <that, Juan? laughs> The way you said that, that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I started laughing. I should have muted my mic. Um, um, I was about to, I was about to say that uh, <laughs> you threw me off. Anyway, um, when see the thing is, not that when they dress like that and they attract other men, and these other men find out about the the man being a woman or a man being a man. I mean, the woman being dressed like a man. These men are upset. But then there are some men that don't care. A lot of these mm -hmm. men that cross-dress and they, they go cross-dress and dress up and go out in public, go to gay bars. Go to these establishments to see if they can get hit on. You know what I'm saying? And, and you're saying that they really don't. They're really not going to go through with the being hit on. They're just going to see that if their dress can get them into uh, in a relationship with somebody or whatever. Yeah. yeah. They, they're trying to see mm -hmm. if they looked apart enough. And then there's some men that just want to, um, their perversion takes it to an extent. And it's not, and it's not homosexual, but it takes it where they're fantasizing about the person that used to be in the the clothing that they're trying on. Well, and, and what did we say about the fantasy? It's not long that you're going to act upon act it. On just them. like mm -hmm. you said, they're just a step away from full-blown homosexuality. Well, that not, not only that, but they're either going to act upon it and they're going to turn it to other things more sinister, like rape, like, you know... Um, kidnapping and things like that because they're fantasizing about the person that used to be in it. Now, a lot of times, some of, some of these women have um, discontinued a relationship with these men only for the men to turn around and try to force their advancements on these women. Mm, mm, mm. So now you have to what? deal with that on a, on, on a whole different level because now mm. these men have turned... What they, what you thought was innocent and cute maybe at the beginning, and then it got kind of weird, and then you stop um, seeing them. But now they have pieces of your, articles of your clothing. Now you're not only into uh, the sinister part of what these things could turn into. Now you're into witchcraft. Mm, wow. Wow. Well, listen what we're saying here, because we don't have that much time left, and we never want to just leave people with just war stories. We want to try to give them some uh, means of total restoration and recovery. And one of the things, Acts 319, we always start off with repent. You know, ask God to forgive you. you Take away uh, this sin, because that's a sin, cross-dressing. The Bible has said, let not the man wear if that that pertains unto the woman, and the woman wear if that that pertains unto the man. So we need to repent. But even after you pray and after you repent, there are some things that you have to follow through. Faith without works is dead. You have One to get rid of the things. One of the very first things that you're going to have to separate. The Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. You're going to have to separate 
from any type of uh, of, of, of imbalance, sexual imbalance. Uh, uh, avoid people that even uh, do these things or avoid being around people or things that promote sexual imbalance. Change. If any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creature. He has changed. Change your lifestyle. Change your lifestyle. If you intend to flee from this, to get away from this, to be delivered from this, you need to change your lifestyle. That includes your dressing. Burn up all of those female clothes and you a male. Burn up all of those masculine clothes. There's a lady that was, uh, uh, I just couldn't hardly take the spirit. Uh, excellent, excellent cleaner, done a wonderful job, but she's always wearing these pants that bag down and sag down and great big old brogang shoes and hats turn around on the side and big old shirts and stuff. And it just really bothered me. It bothered me. You are a lady and you have on all these masculine clothes, these big old heavy clothes and stuff, and you pulling your pants up, walking around sagging. Come on now. Come on now, change, change your dress, change your talk, change your talk. Men don't go around talking about honey, child, change your talk, change your talk. Use masculine uh, 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 conversation, verbs and adverbs and, 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 and adjectives, and your also your walk, change your walk. You were not created to walk in high heels on your toes, change it, stop it, stop it, just stop it. Just put that stuff away from you and stop it. Acts 319, change your style. Change your style. Now, you know, uh, and they say join a good Bible teaching uh, living church. Allow God to nourish you through spiritual uh, parents. I I agree 100% with that, that you need to be in church. You need to be in there for a reason, though. Not not to proselyte, but to be in there for a reason because I have truly changed And I'm here to have some oversight and some accountability. Get into a a, a men's or women's ministry. And above all things, study the Word of God. Study God's Word. Take a Bible and a strong concordance and look up as many references as you can on males and females and and God's love and and, 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 and find out, you know, what, what it is. A lot of times I say that people need to be in 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 uh, uh, great counseling, and not just uh, uh, some of this stuff where some people are doing have never had any counseling skills or whatever, but someone that knows how to really get down to the root of the thing that caused you to have this imbalance because it's a sexual imbalance. It's a sexual imbalance, and you're doing this cross dressing for the purpose of arousing, of arousing sexual feelings in someone else. And you and and you you dressing like a woman and you a man or you dressing like a man and you a woman because you, and you want to arouse the opposite sex. Well, and I'm like Brother Juan now. If I'm really a man in women's clothes and I arouse the opposite sex, a man who's attracted to the women's clothes and the dress and the look and the lifestyle that I have, and when he finds out that I'm really a man in women's clothes, then what's going to happen? What's going to happen? You know, either I'm going to be exposed for being a transvestite, or I'm going to be hurt or beat down, or 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 I'm going to go ahead on and commit the homosexual act with the man that I've aroused the sexual feelings in who thought that he was being sexually aroused by a woman. Now, you know, this sounds confusing, doesn't it, Brother Ron? And, and it can be dangerous. It can be very, this is making my own head spin. (laughs) (laughs) We have two minutes left. This is making my head spin. But this is one of the sexual sins. This is one of the sexual sins uh, in the Bible, uh, uh, cross-dressing, cross-dressing. And clothes do send uh, uh, an image, Mm -hmm. and that image image sends a message. That's that right. Image sends, that image sends a message. And then there are people that are struggling with this, and that's because they are having what we call an issue with gender identity. Gender identity. They need to discover who they are and obey God concerning who they are. Obey God concerning who they are. Because God made you and knew you and formed you before you were even placed in your mother's womb. He knew exactly that you were going to be male or female. Well, Pastor, do you think that that comes from them when they were born 
with um, them having the asexual type of lifestyle growing up. They had the they didn't have blue or pink. They had the green, they had the whites and stuff like that. This is what this is what I'm saying. I I mean they're so confusing that when we were growing up, remember just a little while ago I said that when 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 I was born, everything was 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 there were no great issues. It was you were a boy or you were a girl. If you were a boy, you wore blue. If you were a girl, that's why so many women just wish that they had girls. They said, you know, like, oh, I really hope it's a girl. I really hope it's a girl. And they would just uh, 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 fantasize and think about the wonderful clothes and the frilly dresses and the pretty socks and the hair bows and the ribbons that they would wear. And they would always say, oh, you don't even have any pretty clothes in the store for boys. All they have is just blue jeans and, and, and corduroy pants and plaid shirts. The, the clothes made such a gender distinction. Mm-hmm. But the gender, and in on today, it, on today you go in, and it's difficult to find just all boys' clothes. Even when you go to the nursery, even when you go to the nurseries. When I was born, or or and those you know after me or before me, when you went to the nursery, they would wrap the babies up in a blue blanket if it was a boy, and push it to the window for the new parents to see it or the visitors to see it. If it was a girl, it would wrap it up in a pink blanket, and even over the the little tags that they put on them, it would be pink. It's a girl. It would be boy. It's a, a blue. It's a boy. I mean, there was a gender distinction. Now what they do is they wrap the babies up in yellow. You don't know what it is when it comes to the window. <laughs> You know, you you know, all babies look alike when they're born. You can't tell whether it's a girl or a boy. Some right. boys are born with way more hair than girls. Well, you know, and, and, or, also, or they wrap it up in in yellow or in mint green. And yeah, even the little blankets true. that they have have little animals in in uh, 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 ABC blocks on them, but they're all yellow and blue, uh, yellow and uh, and green, green and white. Well, Pastor, do you think that in you know in closing because we got to get ready to go? But do you think that um, when the, when women are having their kids and stuff out of wedlock and they're wishing that they had a girl that they um, and they end up having boys with the long hair when they start to gr- grow the boy's hair and put braids in their hair is that a part of um I think a, a lot of a, that is uh, uh, gender I think a lot identity? of that is uh style I think a lot of I think a lot of that is for style. My grandson had a lot of hair. He had so much hair, uh, um, way more hair than his sister had when she was born. And 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 they they would just braid it up until they got to be the age that they would usually cut it about a year or a year and a half or so before they started cutting his hair. I mean, we have pictures of his first haircut and and all of that. But we've never put a uh, a uh, 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 Borettes in his hair and and all all that kind of stuff. I think a lot of that hair stuff is the styles that they're wearing now. I think that they're confusing the kids uh, with the gender roles from children up with the colors, with the toys. With the uh, with the role playing, as we said earlier, you know, with the role playing, mm-hmm. my grandson, I'm not gonna let him wear my high heel shoes. Now I've got a little granddaughter, two years old. She wears my high heel shoes. She tries my shoes. She walks in them, you know. But I'm not gonna let my grandson put on my high heel shoes. Right. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna let him. He's a boy. He's gonna be a man. He's not going to wear my clothes. Now that little girl can put on something if she wants to put on something. Well, what do you, but about, he's not what do you think about thing. the um, he, when they buy presents for Christmas and they buy the 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 boy like an easy bake oven? Yeah, you know what? You're the, confusing the, mm-hmm. his gender identity. You're beginning. You know what? This is really good, brother Ron. Someone maybe can call the station and we can continue on with this. We're live on the air at two four eight seven nine six eight two four one. Again, that's two four eight seven nine six eight two four one. Call and we can uh, we can talk with you. You may agree with us. You may not agree with us. But uh, call, and we can discuss this. We're nearing the end of our hour. This has been so great. I'm telling you, this hour just goes by so fast. It does. Especially when we are really hitting on things that need to be uncovered and just coming raw with them, not condemning anyone, not pointing a finger at anyone, but just letting them know what the Word of God is saying concerning these things. And having a discussion. Because a lot of times, a lot of times, Christians don't want to have these type of discussions because they they're taboo and they feel like oh we don't want to we don't want to have that discussion because you give life to it. Well, it's living without you even doing it. 
It, right. It's living. They're going to listen, Brother Juan. Next week, we're going to cover dating, erotic oh. dancing, fatal oh, attraction, fornication, incest, internet sex, oh, if we can Lord get to Jesus. it, kissing, lust, I mean, masturbation. Lord I Jesus. mean, some folks going to get mad with us on next week. Oh, I'm going to I'm gonna have to post this show next week for next week. <laughs> Boy, there's gonna be a lot of people, man. We gonna you gonna have to come into the studio so we can make sure we can get a bunch of calls coming in. I'm telling you, they are gonna be so upset with us. But I want to <laughs> say, God bless you. This is Pastor Harvey from the Rosa Sherry Christian Assembly, and I have just enjoyed so much being with you. I am excited, excited, excited. Once again, I want to say that if you can go to Amazon.com or to one of the book- bookstores, Nobles and Barnes and Nobles, or one of the bookstores and find Sexual Sins of the Bible. It was uh, copyrighted. It's a kind of old text, but I'm telling you, it is still great. Uh, copyrighted back in 2003, and uh, it's several years old, but I've used it in my church. I've used it in my Bible studies, and uh, it is really, really, really an excellent tool to have in your biblical teaching uh, library. Uh, God bless you. I love you. I look forward to seeing you on the very next service. Thank you for listening to the Preached Word broadcast. Fellowship with us at the Rose of Sharon Christian Assembly, located at 19337 Conant, Detroit, Michigan, between East Seven Mile Road and East Outer Drive. Fellowship with us and our Sunday worship service at 11 a.m. Contact us at 313-570-8305 or email any special prayer request to revcdharvey at yahoo.com visit our webpage at worshipcenterradio.net thanks again for listening tune in again next thursday at 8 p.m and i'll see you in the next worship service at 11 a.m at the rose of sharon christian assembly god bless you